Welcome to OCAD University. I'm just, oh, no, now, yes? Thank you. Uh, my name is B.H. Yael, and I've uh, been uh, recruited here uh, inadvertently, but I'm very happy to, to be here. And uh, actually, some of our students, Richard Fung's and my student class is here. So I'm really happy that they'll be here. The students will be part of this discussion as well. Um, uh, I'm here to introduce Public Studio, which is a collaborative practice that Elle Flanders and Tamir Sawatsky have initiated where they work both uh, together and really have been making some amazing work, but also bringing in other kind of collaborat collaborators into the work. Um, their work deals with landscape, war, and the everyday, and has really been significantly multidisciplinary, partly because Elle comes from a practice of photography and filmmaking, and really a very kind of activist, shit disturber kind of person. And, and Tamira has the elegance of an architecture practice. And together that work has really been very productive and, and, uh, and as you'll see. So welcome, and L is the, the one representing them tonight, today, thanks. Thanks, Jill. Um, is this on? You hear me? Yes? Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> I like the way I get shit disturber and Tamira gets uh, elegant. <laughs> and if you saw her and you see me together, it is in fact quite true, <laughs> much to my distress. Um, I also, I know it's sort of becoming rote, but I don't mean it to be rote to thank Claudette um, and John for what has been so far throughout the day such a beautifully curated symposium, an absolute pleasure. I know many of us go to these things and go to various other academic conferences and we sort of want to stick a knife in our head by this point. So thank you for getting to this point without, at least I don't feel like I want to put a knife in my head now. Um, it's been beautifully curated and um, I love the progression throughout the day. So I think it makes sense that we're here now, the sort of the artists who are presenting coming up. Um, certainly I know Rahab's work and I'm excited to learn about James's work as well. Um, I started collaborating with Tamira, my partner, uh, about in 2008 um, when I decided that Palestine was a good place for a honeymoon. Um, so Tamira and I got together and I said, how about Palestine? Um, and she said, that sounds great. <laughs> so I realized I married the right person and I started working with the right person um, who could kind of find the passion that I had um, for Palestine and Palestinian rights. I grew up in Jerusalem. Um, my parents dragged me there as a reluctant Zionist. Um, and luckily I learned my way completely out of it, but it took some time. And uh, it really formed my landscape. And I brought Tamira into that landscape with me. Um, recently she's now dragged me back to her landscape, which is the Canadian North. Um, and I'm actually much more terrified there than I am in Palestine. I was telling Rahab earlier, Israeli soldiers, no problem. Bears and woods and dark places, terrifying. Um, so that says a great deal about the psyche. Um, it's disappointing for me that Tamir is not here, and you'll be somewhat disappointed as well, but hopefully you won't notice, um, because we really are a duo, and collaboration is really at the heart of what we do. Um, we collaborate with many other people, including people like Anna Frizz, who's a fantastic sound artist who's now out at Santa Cruz. Um, and I think Zev is here, who works at OCAD now, who was one of our collaborators in an earlier stage. So it's, um, it's as much a testament to the work that we do to the notion of collaboration. Um, I have one small kvetch um, <laughs> about the projection. And I'm going to make a small plea to OCAD that you get a better projector in here for the artists that come here um, to present their work. Because we work really hard to make our work. And it would be really nice if there was projection that could show our work in that. But that's all I'm going to say about it. Um, thank you. <laughs> so one of the things I actually wanted to do was talk about process today. Because I thought it might be interesting in terms of the linkages that we wanted to make was sort of how do we get to a point in creating images about difficult subjects, difficult images, um, what sort of our, what's the trajectory, what's the process, but also um, 
what's the result of those, of those images? And I thought if I could take us through that a little bit, um, I'm hoping it'd be interesting for you to sort of follow me down that rabbit hole. Uh, our, practice basic, our practice mostly deals with the intersection between social political issues and artistic practice. Even saying that sounds kind of stupid sometimes um, because I can't imagine what else it would be other than um, social political issues. But anyway, that's maybe just me. Um, we tend to engage ourselves with subjects that are urgent, that are present, that are very much in our sphere and in our landscape. Um, and we also work sort of lately, I guess I've been finding more so, we've sort of been giving it this term of sort of an associative kind of working. Um, and the association helps us get our research into motion. Um, that wasn't research in motion, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so one of the things that we're trying to do right now is to find the space in between, to find the resting points that bring us back to art making. So I wanted to just show you this diagram, um, which is hard to see, of course. Um, <laughs> but somebody asked me earlier, oh, is that, um, who asked me? You said, is that uh, a, Lombard a Mark Lombardi? And actually, it was very much uh, influenced by and based on, I I've always loved Lombardi's um, diagrams. And um, this one was something that we developed as a way of thinking for, for our exhibition, our last exhibition called The Accelerators, which we then included in the show so that you know, it would help the spectator walk through the show, understand kind of the linkages that we were making. Um, I call it an apophenia. It was a term that I discovered uh, by a German psychiatrist in the 1950s who was studying schizophrenia and the associations that schizophrenics were making, um, which, to which there is a coherency, obviously, and an incoherency. Um, and it worked really well for us because at the time, what we were looking at here specifically was the connections. Um, this was, it was all based around the Toronto Purchase um, uh, and the treaty um, for Toronto between Toronto and uh, First Nations, the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Um, so the map becomes a kind of mind map of sorts, a diagram, it's a network of relationships. Um, and it was specifically linked to colonialism, economics, trade, and post-colonial fallout. Um, so this is just to sort of give you an example we have of a way of working. I'll take you through that sort of similar process. Um, I know that Claudette had asked me to talk about a piece that we did uh, a year and a half ago um, called Drone Wedding. Um, there was a predecessor to that piece called under the last sky, so I'm gonna talk about how we got to drone wedding and sort of leading us through under the last sky. With everything we've talked about today, the technical sublime, spectacularization, media hype, <laughs> um, it becomes very difficult for an artist to obviously find a place in that. You know, how do we negotiate all those different tangents in terms of the images that we create? And how do we, I have this, I, I've been talking about this idea for, several years now is that, you know, I'm not just interested in making meaning, I'm interested in making meaning matter. <laughs> so, you know, we have to think about that in terms of when you're trying to work out images about um, drone warfare, about war in general. And I was, uh, you know, very much appreciative of the earlier talks today, especially Derek's, you know, where you brought us back down to earth. <laughs> um, and you talked about the bodies. Um, because really what we're talking about here is we are talking about things in the sky um, and we are talking about sort of the absence and the invisibility but you know when we went to the AGO to the show today to John and uh, Sophie's show at, uh, at the AGO you know the first image you see is the image of the x-ray hand <laughs> the first x-ray ever um, making the invisible visible but is it or is it just making it invisible again? What is it that we don't see? Um, so these are some of the things sort of we were looking into when we were we were doing when we were preparing for this these two pieces. Um, you know, I think we're we have we're there are preoccupations uh, uh, today that so much around surveillance and privacy and artificial intelli intelligence and remote warfare. And I thought that it might make sense to try and do this as a, as a networked um, 
as a networked series of events. So this was a talk we gave many years ago, actually. And I'm just bringing up the slide. I won't go into it. Um, but, <laughs> um, but it was a talk that we did that talked about our process and how we get from A to B, or as I say sometimes, how we get to J. Um, I think because of the subject matter that we're dealing with specifically, post-atomic conditions, um, we need to think about networks. We need to think about how images aren't, uh, are constituent of networks, but also the fact that we rarely talk about the single image anymore. <laughs> you know, it's, we, we aren't creating single images anymore, and I sort of want to, I'll come back to that a little bit later, but so much as the photograph, I think what we're looking at is the new production of images. So Drone Wedding and Under the Last Sky, these two works that I'm going to focus on today, began with a trip to Singapore. Um, and in our search for, at the time, what we thought was Singaporean artworks, our research kept leading us back to Singapore as a logistics hub. Um, and also one of the world's largest producers of silicon wafers. But I'm getting ahead. Singapore is a global commerce, uh, financial, and transportation hub. It's been called the city with the best investment potential, the second most competitive country, the third largest foreign exchange center, the fourth largest financial center, the third largest oil refining center. Um, we know that it also has one of the largest and unregulated free market economies, that it's a benevolent dictatorship. <laughs> um, that's on the benevolent part. Uh, a meritocracy, um, or as the economist would call it, a flawed democracy. Well, that was just kind of my favorite, the Nigerians. I just thought that was fabulous. <laughs> I mean, I personally support that because, <laughs> anyway, some people like durians. I won't go down that route. Um, so when, um, when we began researching the economy and the industry, um, it kept taking us back to the high tech and the military high tech that ranked quite high in Singapore. So, and then, interestingly enough, as these things happen, the Singaporean Armed Forces, which were created in 1965, um, were trained by Rahab. Yes, the Israel Defense Forces, correct, <laughs> for five points. Um, so they share what they call a special relationship with Singapore um, and in the development and sale of high-tech weapons and in their uh, otherwise... Um, in their other relationships in there. So this is the CEO of the Israel uh, aerospace industry selling drones in Singapore to various countries. Um, and this was a weapon that was developed specifically for Israel by Singapore. It's called the Matador. Um, hmm. Okay, I'm going to show you. It's the Matador, a multi-purpose, armor-busting, anti-tank weapon, and that's no bull. It's an excellent, very powerful weapon. Shoulder-launched weapons were originally developed for use against tanks and armored vehicles, but the Matador was also designed with urban combat in mind. It's the only uh, munition, as I know today, that is perfectly suitable and developed for urban warfare. One munition that can do everything. What we have here is a sophisticated tandem warhead with a tandem fuse also. You get the gist. Um, it's used in combat deployment to breach walls um, and to walk through walls. Walking through walls was a was a comment and a conversation and a tactic used by the Israel military that's written about by Al Weitzman um, in his discussions with uh, a retired general. Um, the general described how they needed to understand, are you okay? Ah, it's buzzing, got it. Um, the general said that the, he felt that the Israel military needed to understand contemporary situations better, um, such as the occupation. Um, and so they employed what they understood as lateral thinking of leftist philosophers, including Deleuze and Guattari. 
So this was just an image. Um, this was from the vantage point that this was as far as we were allowed. We were there in 2009 and again in 2012. So we were in Gaza, um, and this was the closest that you were allowed. I posed as a foreign journalist, um, which is never a good idea, by the way. Don't try that. Because um, then they ask you for things like credentials, and I didn't have any of those. But that was as close as we were allowed to get, um, and that's where all the journalists were, were allowed to photograph Gaza from because, as usual, Gaza was closed off. Um, so we can talk a little bit more, thank you, about secrecy. Um, so I want to get back to the project, though, in Singapore, and that was a, that was a direct link to uh, one of our many tangential links to um, our practice around war in the everyday in Israel and Palestine. But um, this led us to this project. This is back to the Silicon Wafer um, through Singapore. And um, we started to think about it in terms of this particular shiny object. So this was a show um, that we did in 2013 called Under the Last Sky. Uh, it was an extension of our interest in the paradigms and paradoxes of war and landscape in the everyday. We deal a lot with the banality of war rather than its spectacularization. But when we were sort of faced with this shiny object, this silicon wafer, we needed to think about it differently. Um, so I'll sort of just take you through it a little bit. Uh, while it began in Singapore, it became this series of networked ideas which were sp filtered through a speculative reality of online research that stemmed from, from that wafer. Um, the wafer was of interest to us for several reasons. One is because it's at the core of the production of all integrated circuits. Um, all chip production resides, that resides in computers and cars, high-tech weapons, drones, cameras, are all there. So the production of the wafer relies too on the, what, what was, <laughs> Really interesting was when we started to look at it was that the wafer itself also relies on the oldest photographic technique um, known to us, which was photolithography. And of course, it's done super high tech, but it's based on the concept of photolithography. So um, that's how all the microcircuits are transferred onto the wafer. So I thought it was interesting this morning when Joseph Masco was talking about the direct linkage. Um, pointing out the di direct linkage of photography and nuclear war. And here again, we see this very direct linkage between photography and the production of photography and how photography is done um, and high-tech weaponry and circuits. So this is the actual wafer itself. And I'm going to show you a couple more slides from there. Um, the show begins with a wall piece, which you can sort of see in the background there. Uh, that details the more than a, a thousand strikes, um, illegal drone strikes that occurred in Yemen, Pakistan, and Afghanistan since 2002, the more, majority of which, of course, have occurred under Obama um, since 2009. Our source for this was mostly through the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, but as most of you know, um, finding out the actual details of drone strikes and how many people were killed and who was killed is incredibly difficult work. Um, so this is, the, this is the wall. Again, this idea of wanting to make the unseen seen, although because we don't have the information, we presented it as redacted. Um, and so the people who are actually have been killed have been erased again. On the other side of the room, there's this long vinyl strip of printed images. It's a series of photographs that look like night vision surveillance images. Um, they're of chromite mining in uh, the Pakistan, in the northern, pa in the border region of Pakistan. Um, a dogfight in Afghanistan, two suspect looking men cha changing a Jeep tire, and men tubing down a snowy mountain. And I'll show you some details of that. I don't know if you can see anything, can you? <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> so these are kind of cinematic-like strips. Um, and as I said, they, they appear at first to be surveillance-like imagery, sort of night images. 
Um, but these were actually images that we sourced online. And we contacted the photographers who had taken the images and then had this conversation with them, told them what we wanted to use them for. And a lot of these photographers, some of them were professional photographers, some of them were diplomats working in Afghanistan, and some were just Afghanis taking pictures of their friends tubing down a mountain. Um, so we wanted to take you back to that daily life. So here you can see that very suspect image of the guy changing a Jeep tire, who would most likely be a good target for a drone. So we kind of wanted to put this out there as a conceptual ruse to question our assumptions about how we see how drones and modern technology are now shaping our vision. So somebody who wrote about this show also talked about it. We did it on a vinyl, vinyl strip which stuck to the wall, and he talked about how truth sticks or doesn't, which I thought was kind of nice. Um, this was a detail of the chromite mining. So, and finally back to the wafer. Um, etched onto the wafer on one side are the circuitry of the silicon wafer production. You can kind of see it. Let's see. You can probably see it here. That's probably a better image. And on the other side, what we did was you see the skies over Afghanistan and Pakistan on days of different drone strikes. So we photo, oh, you can, I can't use my mouse, so we photo etched onto this. Actually, it was really interesting to try and re-photo etch these was almost an impossible task. Well, it was an impossible task. So we actually ended up sandblasting onto them. Um, but it was really interesting trying to figure out the process of trying to get this photographic image on it. So this project was the lead up to the next project that we did called um, uh, Drone Wedding. And again, when we were in Palestine in 2012, um, Canada had been stepping up its collusion with Israel. Um, and I don't know if that's going to be part of Rehab's talk, but I'll leave her to that. Um, but this sort of ongoing devastation uh, and terror that we were witnessing, we weren't in Gaza directly, um, but the ongoing terror, you, you know, you, Rahab can talk to you about the psychological terror that's caused by the daily sound of drones. So it's not just in the attack of drones, but it's by the daily drones that are flying over um, that terrorize everyone underneath. So our next project we called Drone Wedding, which was based on the article and based on research we had done in Under the Last Sky, where we talked about uh, um, some research we had done about a wedding party in Afghanistan that was bombed by a drone. Um, indirect contradiction to, uh, who was it, Derek, who uh, said that there was no collateral damage whatsoever. This was some of that collateral damage. Um, so. We thought that it might be interesting to restage a wedding in Toronto um, and film it with a drone. So we wanted to talk about sort of the pervasive surveillance that's also becoming part of a worldwide conversation as well. Um, so we staged, we staged a wedding. It wasn't a real wedding. Um, and we recorded... Um, with five different surveillance cameras and one large drone above. And we created an eight channel video piece um, that works with randomized image selection as well. So um, one of the things is when you see the piece is that there's a randomization to it as well. Um, so this view from above, we were also interested in looking at it. We've been working with sort of axonometric views as well, which I can talk about in a bit in terms of architecture, but I wanted to just sort of focus on this idea of the view from above, which is traditionally obviously a view of power, of state power, corporate power, um, and as one of control, um, which is now being reappropriated for a variety of situations. So. We wanted to look at the instability and the uncertainty and the sense of danger that gets generated by this particular view. Um, and this was the piece. The 
sound in this piece is also done by Anna Frisch. Just talk over it for a second and I'll wrap up here. Um, oh, I'm on here. So some of the things we were looking at was uh, in certainly in the randomization, we were interested in we were interested in sort of the randomization also of drone imagery, this constant collection of images that drones do and interpret them. Um, the sort of who becomes the mind of the image became a really interesting question for us. And so when you actually see the piece, it's not edited in any kind of way that will happen again and again, but rather is set to a randomization. Um, there are sort of three discrete sections, but other than that, the images become randomized. I already and it just kind of builds through time. Does anybody recognize the sound? It's from the WikiLeaks. Yeah. So, because um, it's um, the only other thing I wanted to say was that um, and it starts to build. But the only other thing I wanted to say was that in a recent project of ours, and you know, we we find this more and more as we do more high tech projects, obviously is that we were looking for an LED screen and we went down to New York City to check out a company called Barco that makes very beautiful, very sexy LED screens. And we were invited in to see their showroom where they do all the advertising stuff. Um, and then I passed this other room and I stopped the guy and I said, well, what's in there? Because there were all these monitors and it looked like this incredible kind of mission control room. And he said, oh, that's the stuff we produce for the military. So Barco actually makes um, equipment and military and monitors, et cetera, for, um, uh, for drones. So it was just sort of as we were working on this project, that was sort of another discovery. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. Um, it's very thought-provoking. My question is for James, maybe to address anonymous. Like when you when you talked about um, all of this data that's available to us and the way in which it can get leaked, um, you know, as someone who's an activist, often um, the people who claim the term anonymous do things that seem very inspiring, revealing the police officer who shot somebody um, recently in in Montreal, revealing the addresses and names of police officers. So there's this subversive quality to it all. And of course, we look at uh, Chelsea Manning and, and Snowden as heroes. So uh, you seem to be uh, problematizing that a bit. And I'm wondering if you could address that specifically in terms of that kind of left-wing or perceived as left-wing subversion by, by people like Anonymous or other uh, whistleblowers or leakers. 
Um, I wouldn't say much to that except to say that I'm not, I don't want to completely invalidate the entire history of, of the power of surveillance and the power of turning this image making back onto the image makers and, and, and all of those interactions that are kind of possible within that. Um, but for myself, I think we, we have also become stuck in a, in, a, in a loop between those things that doesn't sufficiently account for power uh, within those relationships, that doesn't, that doesn't, that, that leaves us vulnerable constantly to kind of strike and counter strike and, and an arms race, which is, which is a big part of all these kind of discussions we've had today. Um, th those practices will continue to have huge amounts of power and whistleblowing remains incredibly important and so does uh, so phot photography in, in the context of writing human rights abuses and all those kind of different ways in which it can work. Um, but uh, but it's, it's also not enough. Um, it's, 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 it's no longer enough because it's a, in part because it's a focus on, uh, uh, it, for me it narrows the field of view increasingly. I think what, actually I'd really like to hear your position on this, uh, in terms of what you're saying about not making single photos anymore, or not, um, like, so to, to talk about this kind of, um, not making, not focusing on the single image or the single revelation anymore is also a recognition that they exist within, I'm just rambling now. Um, I don't want to invalidate those practices. Um, I, I think we're starting to see that they are insufficient in the long run. And by the long run, I do mean like, you know, species length time. So it's not like time we should dump them right now. Uh, but I think there needs to be a, a wide discussion about what follows those practices. I have a question. I've been thinking about something listening to these, all three of you, in terms of um, uh, something Joe said in his talk that I can't get out of my head, which is that nuclear testing has turned into actual warfare. And that there's a kind of collapsing between the test, the preparation, and the act itself. And I guess when I think of drone wedding, I see a kind of, I'm wondering if, you know, if, there, if you're advocating a kind of collapsing of the event and the representation of the event. And then I see in James, your piece, in your talk, and I'm, I don't know yet how I feel about this, but it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that you're saying it's not just an analogy. Big data uh, and, and, and radiation and toxicity, that you want to somehow expand the category or at least produce it as a, as a generative category that might repoliticize us. And then it leads me to, the, you know, to Palestine, and I'm wondering what that kind of move might mean for you on the ground, if it's something that could be a new, if that's something you might want to reject because your, the struggle that you have right there doesn't allow, wants to hold these categories separate the category of being there and the representations of it, uh, or if it's something that maybe uh, also might be mobilized in, in your own work. I'll take the, I'll take the middle part. Um, in relation to drone wedding, and I, I think very much that was part of the strategy, um, which is also why we decided to stage wedding, and that for a while, it was hard for us to sort of almost separate the actual outcome of the piece and the piece and the actual performance of it as well, because the performance was as much the piece as what ended up being the eight-channel work. Um, and just sort of being in that space and having this wedding, having this drone, having people interact with it, was in a way trying to understand it, not so much deconstruct the power of that drone, but to at least sort of crack that open a little bit um, to understand it. And um, certainly, I think there was, we, we weren't thinking about it in terms of bringing the war home, um, but we were trying to collapse some of those um, very broad distinctions made between over there and over here. Uh, in the sense of talking about how this is pervasive, um, that it has completely different implications for us, um, but that it is part of a larger network and a larger mechanism. So. It's, um, it's very complicated uh, in Palestine, dealing with image 
And through my work, I've been experimenting with, uh, like, um, moving image without sound, muting the sound fully, or removing the image and keeping the sound. And this has to do with the Western culture, how it's really based on, on vision and denying the other senses, if I'm understanding your question. But it's complicated, and we have to look at the, the conditions in Palestine in a different way, uh, because you have uh, a colonial regime that practices uh, oppression on daily basis, and it fights the image. It, it's it's an covert operations, what they do, like, just uh, drawing a line in any piece of land within a uh, colonized West Bank would mean it's a military zone, and military zone, no photographing allowed, for example. So for me, and I'll speak straight, photographing there, taking images, it's like having an evidence of something that took place. That's how significant. On the other hand, conceptually, I am very much interested in the effect of sound because it, it ties us together as human being everywhere, anywhere. The sound itself, without the image, it removes all biases, all stereotypes, and it just connects us to the feeling the, the feeling of fear, the feeling of excitement, uh, any, any form of feeling. I went <laughs> for that. <laughs> um, thank you for actually probably expressing that rather more elegantly what I was trying to say in mine. I think that I'm going to, could you write that down? Um, but uh, I would just to, to say about that collapse is, is important to what I'm, I'm thinking about, and it comes from two explicit or more things in my work. Um, the first one of which is, is working with drones and, lo and looking at the history of what a lot of us have been talking about in, in terms of that and, and watching specifically the, the kind of the, the, what's been called the Palestinianization of, of the whole world, which is not, I hope, to, to downgrade the Palestinian experience as part of it, but the way in which technologies developed in that crucible have been spread out across the whole world um, in, in, in many ways. And the fact that technology is, is, a, is, is, is an encoded politics that can then be redeployed on multiple different sites to kind of carry the, so many of those different actions and ways of seeing with it as it goes. Um, and uh, the second part of that is, um, I did a project last, uh, last year where I flew a massive military surveillance balloon over South London. Uh, and I put a camera on it because aerial photos are cool uh, and because I wanted to interrogate the notion of, of, of the view from the air and, and, and the sky. And then I had to take that camera off it because I just I, I was doing more surveillance uh, because um, and I got to a point with that project that I felt I could not make any more images at all because every image that I was making in the course of that project was a surveillance image and it led me to this kind of block in, in the work where I was like how do you make work about surveillance that doesn't do more surveillance how do you make work about vision systems that doesn't perpetuate the mechanics and the politics of those vision systems and this is a project that I think many people have run up to in, in various ways but 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 exactly that that for me that so many of these practices, including the very base kind of visible, in, invisible, visible type trajectory, felt complicit with those kind of structures. As we heard in the talk earlier of how much of our, our vision systems are, are the products of, 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 of nuclear explosions. And that multiplied a, a thousand times over. I'd like to, inter I'd like to uh, invoke my privilege here by asking a question to James, uh, which is how, how then do you make art after reaching the conclusion <laughs> you reached in this paper. <laughs> Is it over? No. Obviously not. This is the business. Sorry. <laughs> That's what we're all here to figure out, but I'm not going to pretend I have a direct answer to that question. Yeah, I mean, similarly, I think we all have hit walls for sure. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it was so striking, I think, in Rahab's work specifically, when you just don't see the image. Um, and I've always remembered that piece, and it's such a powerful piece because once you remove that image, you know, you start to put your other faculties into it and you work much harder. Um, but we are so overwhelmed and bombarded, and which is why I was saying in my talk as well, it's like, where is that space 
for us now. And I think that that's something that we face pretty regularly now as artists. I, I, I don't think you stop, you just sort of keep trying to dodge left and right. Well, actually, I, I thought of a uh, filmmaker, I think it's uh, Chris Marker. And I think his last film, Crossover in Dubai, and it's not well known. Crossover in Dubai, and it's about the assassination of a Palestinian leader in Dubai that was captured by CCTV, the state surveillance, the entire process. So he just took the footage and changed the sound, inserted a, a well-known piece of music, and made it his work. But it's loaded with meanings and thoughts about how surveillance, like while you're recording, you surveillance, the surveilled, et cetera. It's a cycle. Yeah. I mean, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I, I don't think you jettison. <laughs> Your practice, I think that you you find you find other ways and other means, but I think it also goes to the very heart of what your practice is. So I don't know if that makes sense, but let's try that. Hi, thank you. Um, I want to take your point because I agree that the transparency is still very blurred and it's non-existent. But it's also because it's so frightening. There's a website called mindjustice.org, which has documented the use of electromagnetic radiation on the human brain during the Cold War by all the superpowers. It's connected to, uh, I believe, the University of California and a lot of the reports have been presented to the United Nations, which is chiefly ignored as much as Israel having a nuclear weapons program. It's also very much connected to what's happening in neurology and the law and neuroscience, particularly in the United States and other prison systems, for example, where they would use um, different psychobabble to construct criminal behavior rather than take issue with white on white on crime in our banking systems, etc. So I, d I just wanted to articulate that because I think it's important. I also um, just think it's important that mindjustice.org be used as a cross reference for academics and artists. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Ian Bowl here. Uh, thanks all three of you. Very, very rich session. Uh, I just wanted to uh, pick up on the, the, the puzzle that we've, we're left with here. Uh, and it, it seemed to me to connect to something that uh, I was grappling with at the end there and this morning, namely the uh, perhaps the end of the Enlightenment project. I mean, Chomsky is a classic uh, of someone I think who still believe that you can tear the mask off power, and then you know things will crumble. It's just it is it isn't happening. I mean, maybe you can surprise the ruling class every once a generation. Uh, Nick Walter and the others who went into RSG6, that did make a difference, a big difference uh, politically, um, but we're no longer in that situation. So I just want to share the, you know, this important question, you know, what, and it's the, it's the question we finished uh, afflicted powers with, you know, what would image making against spectacle look like? And, and I think, you know, we're, we're honestly up against it here. Um, and We've landed on the right question. Uh, and these are certainly very, all very, you know, powerful interventions. Uh, but making the linkages between the wafer makers and, and, and the drones, um, 
is useful and important, uh, but, but where then? So really, I, I'm not getting any further. I'm just reiterating that it's a damn good question. I, th I think partially, though, Ian, it's also the question is not so much what would it look like, but I think it's how do we employ? And I think we've been trying that. How do we employ images? How do we use them? Um, so I think it's, you know, I think we've used many strategies over the years to try and unspectacularize the image. <laughs> Um, and I think that, you know, at, like, uh, like various actions, things have worked over time in certain times. Um, I think we have come to the end of it to some degree. Um, but I think now the question is different. The question is, how do those images, how do they get deployed? And I think that that was partially the, partially at least one of the, one of the strategies we were trying with the randomization just to sort of stop thinking about the image as if this image is important. <laughs> um, but rather, it's the network of images and the collective story that the images are creating um, through some kind of randomized, without selection at that point, without the edit. You know, uh, perhaps a feeble attempt, but <laughs> an attempt nonetheless to bring that issue to, to the fore. Um. To go slightly back on, on well, not to go back on what I said, but to give a couple of examples, I th the, the, the image practices that, that do, I think, really interest me are, are, are the ones where that um, evidentiary quality or activated quality is, is actually is way above the, the point of the image. And so, for example, I would take the, the forensic architecture's work as a, as a place within that, that that considers the, the legal ground and the, those, um, like, really where it's going, that actually treats the image as a program uh, that learns from... Um, uh, the learns from what I would call the network computers, my obsession with technology, uh, and sees in that the, 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 uh, a model for how this stuff should go forward. Uh, an, an example of even just a, a few images is Trevor Paglin's project of photographing uh, the NSA and NRO and these Washington buildings. But the work in that work is not the images. The work in those work is the licensing of those images in which they're released into the public domain to supplant, uh, to supplant I images that were provided in other ways. Um, it still falls out of some of my rules, but um, but I think there's something in in those kind of image practices that um, that are, are treating the image as as um, as I don't know um, as, as as merely you know a way into to other structures. That's not right. Either. Something along those lines, anyway. 